be here. I, I feel like I've been uh, thanked a little too much today. I am uh, very grateful that the Free Soil Project reached out, and I just want to say this at the outset. I'm grateful that people like you exist in this country, not just this state. I'm not here, I'm not from Iowa. I live in an apartment in Des Moines now. It feels like I'm in Iowa. I'm from Iowa. But I'm here because this issue affects the entire country, actually. And I'm grateful for the people of the Free Soil Project, not just the ones in Iowa, but the ones I've met in South Dakota and elsewhere across the Midwest. You're not here today to endorse me. I really mean this. I'm here to endorse you. That's why I'm here today. And I want to tell you a little bit about the journey that brought me to this issue. You know, one of the questions I always ask, Look at me, the next president. What's the standard that I use to know whether we're doing something right or wrong in this country? It's this. When our founding fathers, and I picked some different ones, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, John Jay, these are guys who disagree with each other on a lot of things, okay? But would that group of founding fathers, get out a few more in there, would they be proud of the way that we are conducting our nation today, or would they be ashamed? If they see what's happening right here in the state of Iowa, taking your land to push this through, easements across farmland to do what? We're going to talk about that. They would be appalled. I want to just address something at the outset. I think that, I forget which industry association it was, one or, one or the other of them, was issued a statement yesterday saying that uh, I was being politically opportunistic seizing on this issue, that this is an insincere political stunt. I want to, I want to address that. Yeah, so the first thing I, I said, and I also uh, did an exchange with Bruce Rastad after we announced this event, I, and I sincerely wanted to keep making good on a promise that I made. I said that if there was somebody who wanted to, either from the state legislature, or from the Iowa Republican Party, or Republican establishment, or from industry, that wanted to attend this event, and to make the case for these pipelines from the standpoint of the public interest that I would give them a portion of my time on this stage, and I'd ask you to join me in doing it with respect so that we may hear all sides of this issue. I've gone out of my way in the last six months to try to learn that for myself. I understand what some of their arguments are, but I wanted to first see if anybody took me up on that offer and I wanted to make good on that promise. Is there somebody here who would, before I offer my remarks, like to make the public case for why these pipelines advance the interests of Iowans and advance the interests of the general public? I want to just pause and see if they took me up on the offer. If they arrive before the end of this, I will still make good on that pledge, because I think it's important that we have free speech and open debate in this country. Let me tell you what drew me to this issue. This isn't something that I came to in the last number of weeks. Long before I was running for president, for those of you who read my books, I wrote two books dedicated, one of them particularly dedicated to the so-called ESG movement in this country, the use of environmental, social, and governance factors to affect the allocation of capital. They're using our money, retirement accounts, 401k accounts, pension funds, by the way, including Iowa's own pension funds, which are invested with BlackRock. Go a little secret, you probably didn't know. Um, <laughs> you know we, we understand this in depth. To advance and vote for social and political agendas that do not advance our own best interests. And so being that, one of the things that I did, I didn't write these books, I also started a firm called Strive. This is an asset manager that was the first head-on anti-ESG competitor to BlackRock. And in my capacity as the executive chairman of Strive, which was the role that I stepped down from to pursue this run for U.S. president, I actually wrote shareholder letters on behalf of the shareholders to Chevron. Glad you brought up Chevron and Exxon about bending the knee to this global climate religion in a way that did not advance anybody's interest, even that of, in my view, their own shareholders. So this is something that I, I've been trying to drive change through through the private sector for a long time. But what led me to this journey to run for president, actually, was understanding that it wasn't the invisible hand of the market, as Adam Smith would have observed, that led us to where we are. 
It was the invisible fist of government guiding the behavior of that so-called market. And I realized I couldn't fix that by just taking on the ESG cartel and that bureaucracy through the private sector. We had to do that through the front door here as well. So I was in Pottawatomie County early on in this campaign. I declared at the end of February, in the month of March, I don't know if those of you know a woman who's become a friend of mine since Starlin Purdue, but she was walking around Western Iowa, and we went and we visited a cow pastor, and that was where the farmer there told me about this issue for the first time. And I learned about it, I learned a lot that day. And I put out a video sharing my thoughts on this carbon capture pipeline, and particularly this idea of, you know, because I know the global ESG agenda, the global climate agenda, this was one story among many others. I could give you countless others, and it stood out to me. But the thing that really stood out to me was the use of eminent domain. The idea that not only were they going to use our money to advance some other agenda that didn't advance American interest, to, to what end? Capturing carbon dioxide and burying it in the ground? Come on, this is one of many jokes that we've adopted in this country. But what stood out to me is not only are they going to do this, not only are they going to waste billions of dollars of taxpayer money to do it, but that now they were going to go further and potentially seize land to see this through. So I put out a video, put it out on social media, shared my thoughts on this. It was a continuation of what I've been talking about for the last few years. And I say this, give you this preamble to tell you what happened then. I got phone calls from the establishment across this state. I got to tell you, I mean, I mean, some of them were within minutes. I mean, I, I, just, I think it was a weekend, it was a Saturday. I was shocked. By then, back then, people didn't even know. Half the people in this country didn't know who I was. I was back then a no-name presidential candidate. I was shocked. And I was guided through being educated on this issue, which I keep an open mind to. But what I was told at the time, this is back in March, is that eminent domain was not on the table. The reason I've come back to this issue now is that that has proven to be false. And now I'm coming back with a vengeance. Okay, because I said, yes, okay, this is not a big issue. We need to see. That's what, that's what uniquely brings me to this issue. And so I want to get into the, the meat and potatoes of this a little bit. When... Yeah, I'm not gonna, I was going to give you kind of a historical view in the private property rights speech. I'm not going to do that. I want to go into the specifics of this issue. And I challenge the industry association that was claiming this is an opportunistic speech for people who favor these pipelines. I want to challenge Governor Kim Reynolds. I want to challenge your four Republican congressmen. To tell me what I am about to tell you what have I gotten wrong here? And if after hearing what I'm about to say, you still support the use of eminent domain implicitly or explicitly to advance these pipelines, then have the courage to stand up in front of your own constituents and make that case. I saw that they're not here today. But what I'm about to tell you, we're going to have open debate. This isn't going to be one of these hush hush issues. Political consultants, they will tell you. Do not touch this issue of your presidential candidate. There is a reason why not a single other main Republican presidential candidate has laid hands on this issue. I've seen it. I've seen the pressure of that. We're not hush hush sweeping this under the rug anymore. We are having this debate in the open. And I'll ask each of you to do the same thing. If somebody wants to come here or somewhere else, and we're going to be doing this, by the way. This is the beginning of something for the next 50 days. We're going to take a different part of the state. We're just going to look at Somebody wants to walk in and give us the alternative view, join me. We will give them the platform to make their case. But I think part of the reason they're not here is there is no case to be made for why this benefits the public interest. So I'm going to scrap the political speech and get into detail. I'm going to make you five points today. First, and I'm going to go into the details of it, the climate change agenda is a hoax. And you have to understand why to get the heart of this issue. That's point number one. Point number two is that eminent domain, as used to advance this carbon dioxide capture pipeline, is illegal and unconstitutional. <laughs> Point number three is that if I am wrong about that, if the courts and your Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court disagree with me on that, I don't think they do, but if they do and I'm wrong about that, then I want everyone to understand what Pandora's box that opens. Because if removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to bury it in the ground is a case for eminent domain, 
I'm going to tell you exactly what that means is coming. That's number three. Number four is the best argument for the other side. I've spent six months since they tried to, you know, educate me on this issue. I've gotten all perspectives on this. The best argument is this is going to be good for Iowa, economically bringing money to the ethanol industry. I'm going to address that. And then number five, I'm going to give you the solution on how we deal with this. And I know you, you all have been gracious and thankful and thanking me as a presidential candidate for shining attention on this, and that's fine. I'm going to continue to do that. I'll also make you a pledge today. If for whatever reason I am not successful this spring in winning the Republican nomination, I will continue in my advocacy on this issue until we have achieved our goal. I'll do that today. We're not going anywhere on this issue. But I am in this to win this. And more than just calling attention to it, there is something the next U.S. president absolutely can, and I think has a duty to do and see through. So those will be the five points we go through today. This is not a polemic speech. This is something that offers, I think, it's not left or right, it's not black or white, it's not even, it's not nothing political about the points I'm about to make. And I challenge everybody who said that these are sham political arguments, challenge this on the merits. Let's talk about number one, the climate change agenda is a hoax. Now, I'll prove that to you. The Earth is more covered by green surface area today than it was a century ago because carbon dioxide is plant food. A crop, a, a farming station knows your crops rely on carbon dioxide. That is a form of carbon removal. Deep forests are a form of carbon removal. And without going on too much of a tangent here, it's interesting that the proponents of deforestation are somehow the ones who are also among the biggest proponents of capturing, pipe, capturing carbon through a pipeline and burying it in the ground. There is a 98% reduction in the climate disaster-related death rate over the course of the last century. The number of people who died in 1920. The facts I'm about to share with you, by the way, Microsoft owned LinkedIn. Initially locked my account for sharing what I'm about to share with you. Said violated their policies on hate speech, misinformation, and violence. Violence is included on that. I'm not making this up. But as I point out the facts, you know, here's, here's, here's the facts. Zero to contest it. They claimed it was locked in error after that. So nobody's going to contest what I'm telling you here. 98% reduction in the climate disaster related death rate. Heat waves, tornadoes, hurricanes, you name it. For every 100 people that died in 1920, you want to know how many died today? Two. Okay? The same people who are most opposed to carbon dioxide emissions in the United States are perfectly fine with shifting those same carbon emissions to places like China, which laughed as we left that 2015 summit in Paris, because they're the ultimate winners of it. They were the ones who actually wanted that summit convened because this allows China to catch up to the United States. The same people who are most opposed to those carbon emissions are also opposed to nuclear energy in the United States, which is the greatest form of carbon-free energy production known to man. Eight times as many people will die of cold temperatures this year than warm ones. That is a fact. So what is the climate change agenda after I call it a hoax in part because it has nothing to do with the climate. It has everything to do with power, dominion, control, and punishment in service of letting China catch up to the United States in the name of what they call, you get it straight from the UN, global equity. So that is why the climate change agenda is a hoax, and it is unnecessary to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That's the first point. And we could go on and spend the whole day on just that, but I'm not going to do that. It's an important backdrop, though, to understand the legal arguments that will then follow. So, so the second point is this. Against that backdrop, the use of eminent domain to seize private property or to seize an easement over private property is illegal except for a really narrow set of circumstances. And Steve, you did a great job. You actually have been very helpful in advancing my own understanding of this issue. But I'm just, for everyone here to really leave here today fully armed and equipped to be able to go explain this issue to a hundred of your neighbors. And that's my ask of you coming in here today. That's it. We have one ask. Go tell a hundred people, the hundred that could not be here, 
in this room, but who deserve to know. Tell them exactly what they need to know about this issue. So in service of that, I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail. Kilo versus City of New London. It's a special day to be discussing. Sandra Day O'Connor, God bless her, hope she rests in peace, died today. She wrote a legendary dissenting opinion in a 5-4 case that the Supreme Court today would go the other way on, which held the dissenting opinion, which has been adopted by Iowa, Iowa's own Supreme Court, a case right here much more recently, that there's two options for what can be used for eminent domain, the seizure of private property. One is, is it a public use? Now, I'm a skeptic of eminent domain, period, but if the government has some public use, not from a private company, but some public use, that's the limited circumstance in which eminent domain is able to be used. That's tied to the Fifth Amendment, to this thing we sometimes forget called the Constitution of the United States. But in that case, five to four in the other direction with the liberal justices, they expanded to say it's not just for public use, but for public purpose, which in that case included, I think it was Pfizer expanding into New London in Connecticut, to say that they would create a bunch of jobs. And that was one of the justifications that they used to say that that public purpose, creating those jobs, was also good enough to support the private seizure of land. Well, first thing I'll just observe right off the bat here before I tell you why that was a badly decided case. There hasn't even been, to my knowledge, somebody making the case there's going to be a lot of jobs created as a consequence of these carbon capture pipelines. So it doesn't even meet the, the test for making the case for a public purpose. But put that to one side. Those dissenting justices, O'Connor, Rehnquist, Thomas, wrote one of the most legendary Supreme Court dissents in that case that was adopted by the Iowa Supreme Court saying that the state constitution as interpreted here, that has its own provisions on eminent domain, agree with the Sandra Day O'Connor view. Agree that it has to be limited to a public use. But the good news is the people who came before you, the Republican Party who came before the puppets you have today running the Republican Party, have actually laid a good groundwork in this state. 479B is another statute in this state that lays out for hazardous liquid pipelines, what are the standards? And that's exactly what these are. These are hazardous liquid pipelines. What is the limited case in which you're able to use eminent domain? And others have said this before. They've done a great job, but I'm just really laying it out so everybody leaves with a good understanding. It has to be necessary and convenient. So then the question is, A, is this a public use? No, it's not. These are private companies being showered billions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer money upon them. Those are companies, not the state. Second, pursuant to the Iowa Code, 479B, is this necessary? I submit to you that the removal of carbon dioxide and then putting it into a pipeline to run across three states and burying it in the ground in North Dakota is not anything that comes close to the standard of what meets the legal test of necessary. That is why these projects are illegal and unconstitutional under settled law. And furthermore, why we would go further and overturn Kilo versus the city of New York. I would go further as well. The necessity weighs the costs and benefits. So not only are there not benefits here, there are real risks. Someone earlier made reference to the incident in Mississippi. A good portion of a town ended up in a hospital after a leak on the back of flooding. I might go so far as to say not only is it, does it fail to meet the necessary test, it might actually just be unnecessary to create that risk. So where are we so far? The climate change agenda is a hoax. And because the climate change agenda is based on false premises, the, the idea that removing carbon dioxide and burying it in the ground is some sort of public emergency, that undercuts the legal argument for eminent domain. So that's where we are. But suppose I'm wrong. That's point number three. Suppose I'm wrong about that. And we agree that somehow this removal of carbon dioxide from the sky is necessary. We have no choice but for the future of humanity to bury this in the ground through this pipeline, running through Iowa and South Dakota and Nebraska and North Dakota, and put it in the ground. This is an emergency of an order that meets the test for being necessary for eminent domain. If that's really the case, then I want you to know what's coming. 
Ethanol plants are not the only things that emit carbon dioxide into the air. You mark my words, if that meets the test, that justifies the Biden administration or anybody else coming after them to be able to come into your home and seize your gas stove and leave a $50 check in your mailbox because it was necessary. I'm not, this is, this is not a joke at all. Come in and they said, the internal combustion engine in your car, well, anyone who does not have an electric vehicle, bring the tow truck on your driveway, drag that out, leave a $50 check in your mailbox because that emits carbon. This is necessary. A furnace, frankly, for farmers, a cow. Well, least that thing. I mean, the same argument applies. If this is really necessary, we're taking that to its logical extent, and the government gets to determine and set the price at which they seize it for this necessity, that's the Pandora's box in the door that we're opening. And I come back to, would George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson be proud, or would they be appalled? They would be appalled. They would be aghast at what they say. So the question is, why are the Republican puppets that, you know, claim to represent you quietly supporting this issue or even worse, ignoring it? The only thing worse than someone, I say, I, here, I, say this. I have yet to see someone who is publicly making the case for it. That I will respect. I mean, somebody can always disagree with me or you or anybody else. That's the American way. We have free speech and open debate. People have earnest policy disputes and disagreements. Even if I may disagree deeply with you, I'll always respect your right to say it. I'll always respect even your willingness to publicly make a case that I disagree with. I'm yet to meet, and it's not for lack of trying, a Republican in this state who supports this, who will publicly make the case for it. But then that brings us to the question of why is nobody in this state who's effectively supporting this unwilling to even speak about it? Why do you have a governor right now? This is not taking away anything away from our other accomplishments. I respect a lot of them. I've publicly been very laudatory. And you know, I, I think that she's done a great job in a lot of respects in your state. This is to take nothing away from that. But we're here to talk about this issue. Why is it that the Republican governor of your state and of South Dakota and of North Dakota, but we're in this state today, so in Iowa, can't utter so much of a peep about an issue that most people are against. So, so the answer is, I have to do some real digging here, because nobody's making this case. But when I put together kind of the pieces between the whispers backstage and, you know, the uncomfortable conversations that are trying to sweep this under the rug, I want to know the best argument for the other side, right? Even if these people are cowards and bought and paid for, most of them are. Then there's got to be a good policy agreement, right? But if we really want to, you know, it's, it's a... Uh, yeah, it's something my 11th grade English teacher taught me, right? If you can't state the best argument for the other side, then you don't know what you actually think yourself. So even if they're not serving it up, I, I want to connect the dots and try to understand, right, these puppets doing what they're paid to do. Let's get what, what would be the best argument for the other side. Here's the best I can do. That even though this is completely senseless, even though the climate change agenda is a hoax, even though we know that our constitutional principles teach us that eminent domain is only used, if ever, in limited circumstances for public use, not purpose, but use, and only when it's necessary. But we're still going to flout that because, say I'm an Iowa representative or a congressman or a governor, I guess if they're handing us free money to an industry that's important to us, we might as well at least take it. Right? So I think that's... I wish somebody would just stand up and say it. They haven't even said this, but this is, I think, the best possible argument and the best possible policy argument we could make for the other side. So let's take that seriously. Let's say somebody is earnestly doing this not just because they're you know, having their campaigns or whatever propped up by the check writers, but that they actually believe that their duty is to look after that short-run economic interest. That doesn't really hold water on a few levels. One is... Here's the reason why. So they say you can't sell into California, right? And California is a big part of the culprit here. European markets are also a big part of the culprit. But California will say you can't sell into the California market unless you're adopting certain of these CO2 lowering standards. But I want people to understand this. California has said they're going to ban the combustion engine vehicle in like a matter of a decade. So it's sort of what who was it? Mao Zedong, I think, was saying, <laughs> cynically, 
before. See a blown up picture of Xi Jinping, not quite now, but he tries to, you know, he wears the suits and tries to act like him. They will sell you the rope today that they will use to hang you tomorrow. So why on earth are we selling that rope to California now? Right? Did you know where this ends? So you have two choices, either submit and get the morsels that you collect and the crumbs along the way in the meantime, those 10 years, or you stand up for what's right and say the whole damn thing is a hoax and we refuse to be oppressed in our own space. Stand up for what is true. Stand up for what is true. You will not tread on it. Don't tread on it. That's the correct answer right now. To stand up for the long run. For the state as opposed to the supremacy of this other state over us. Here's the other thing about the California. I don't want you guys to understand this, because I've gone down this rabbit hole now. Once I got into this, I couldn't, I really couldn't pull myself out. Here's the ultimate irony of this. So California says the ethanol producers in this state can't sell into California unless they're doing this you know, hocus pocus carbon pipeline crap. Now get this. To bring this full circle, you want to know what state bans carbon capture pipelines in their state is California. I'm not making this up. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's unbelievable. I mean, these people, it's, it's at a level that you can't believe the things I'm telling you. So, so, so then this argument, right, because I actually think I'm more deeply, I'm probably a more deeply pro-ethanol candidate than anybody else running on first principles. But what they will say, right, is, the industry, so the people who are in the ethanol business are also the one doing the, you know, this pipeline capture hocus pocus. So what they'll say is, no, this is unfriendly to the ethanol industry. No. It's actually holding the ethanol industry hostage by purposefully duping, not you in this room, but I mean duping us and duping the citizenry of the state. It's all about smoke and mirrors. They will tell you it's about ethanol. Get to the bottom of what's actually happening. You can produce ethanol without having to apologize for releasing some small amount of carbon dioxide. So the idea that the only way you could produce ethanol is only if you capture carbon dioxide, but then if you say you're opposed to the pipeline, somehow you're opposed to ethanol, is a trick. It is designed to dupe you. And this is why we cannot have politicians and including at the presidential level, I'm sorry to say this, but it's just true, who are taught by some consultant through a teleprompter and read to you what they're supposed to say because then they'll fall for the smoke and mirrors. You've got to get to the bottom. And we live in a complicated moment in this country. The threats to liberty are not what they once were. They're complicated. It's a hybrid of corporate power and state power that together do what neither one could do alone. That's what the ESG cancer is really all about. We require leaders at every level, several of them in this room, who don't buy just the slogans from 1980 and say this is just big government. It's a new complex hybrid. I would go so far at every level, from local to the presidential. We need leaders who are able to cut through to the bottom of what's actually happening. This is not about protecting the ethanol industry. In fact, this is one of the most long-term harmful death knells to the ethanol industry if it's bending the knee to markets that eventually will cause it to cease to exist. So don't buy the crap they're selling it on that. So, so then, then there's, there's one layer deeper on this, and, and Doyle actually brought this up. And I'm grateful. He's another guy who went down the rabbit hole. Doyle, where are you? Still around? There you are, man. So, even if you accept, so let's say this argument that 45Q, 45Z, and those are the provisions of the federal law that, by the way, Republicans and Democrats serially have signed and expanded in the amounts of subsidy to say, that, hey, well, why would we want just our own, if somebody else is going to collect it, why wouldn't it just be bioethanol producers? Fine. There's a way to do this with methanol conversion that does not require running thousands of miles of pipeline across people's land who don't want it run across their land. So, so it, this line requires getting into this level of detail, right? It is not just some, you know, to the people who are saying, you know, this is a, 
the, the industry association saying this is just a political, I think the word they use is clickbait. I, I don't think that level of detail is going to get a lot of clicks. But you all are here because you care about it. So I think you have to be in a position, you have a responsibility, what Jake said. You, you are one, at least. So you can make yourself a hundred by making sure that the other people in the state are actually educated on the essence of that issue. So what have we said so far? The climate change agenda is a hoax. Against that backdrop, eminent domain is illegal and unconstitutional. If we're wrong about that, that means they can take everything in your home and leave a $50 check in your mailbox. And this false argument that somehow this is good for Iowa's ethanol industry is a bunk argument. Now what do we actually do about it? Three things at three different levels I'm going to lay out for you. One is the Iowa Utility Board's hearings on this begin next year. Presidential election is not the only important thing happening next year. There's other thing, important things happening right here. Let's give them the benefit of at least a neutral presumption that they will do what the law requires them to do. They need to hear from you. The people on that need to be able to understand every level of detail that I've laid out on the stage today. And if somebody else wants to come up and make the opposing case, great, they should understand that too. And my bet, I begin with the presumption of good. Let them come down on the right side and say that eminent domain cannot be used to advance these carbon capture pipelines. That's option one. Option two is to suppose they don't do that. And I think, by the way, it would be, wouldn't it be a little helpful if the governor who has appointment rights to that utilities board might have had something to say about this issue between now and then? Other than silence. Number two is, if they come down to the wrong side of that, that's an immediate appeal to the Iowa Supreme Court, which has adopted the dissenting opinion in Kelo versus New London to say that this is not a public use and a track to take this to the Supreme Court to do something I want to see happen under my watch as U.S. President, see Kelo versus the City of New London overturned by the Supreme Court on the current Supreme Court that happened six to three, restoring private property rights, no eminent domain for private gain. That's what that's all about. And then there's a role for the U.S. President. The U.S. President swears an oath to the Constitution. Helps to have a President who's read the Constitution. It doesn't happen all the time when they swear oath to it. But I swear oath to the Constitution, I intend to keep it. I think that there's an easy solution. So, so the, the ideal solution that many people, you know, myself included, would love to favor and otherwise would be to say, why were these subsidies ever enacted? Rescind them, get rid of them. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that seems pretty sensible. But the system, you know, swamp runs deep, including through Congress, including the people who are the puppet masters of those congressmen. They have tried, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, Steve King actually told me about one of the episodes where they've tried, and you know who stands in the way? Certain Republican congressmen who were a little close to humble. But, but here's what I will say, though. So, so I'm not going to promise you what I, I, I never make a promise of what Congress is or isn't going to do, because I can't make that promise to you. That's where presidents consistently disappoint the people. They say that something's going to do it, Congress doesn't do it, and then everybody's left throwing their hands in the air. So yeah, of course, that would be a nice solution. But let me give you something actionable. If you swear an oath to the Constitution and keep it, and you believe that this is an inappropriate use of eminent domain for all the reasons we've laid out, then you can apply that law in a manner. You have to read the law. It's a principle of legal construction. You have to read the law in a manner that is consistent with the Constitution. That if the subsidies are going to any private party, who is invoking eminent domain on an unconstitutional basis, they won't get it. That's the real solution here. That's the backstop. So what you want out of a presidential candidate, ideally, the whole point of it is to be a president, but you want a president who actually can see through what actually needs to get done. Not just to do the easy thing, but to do the hard thing. Not just to speak the truth when it's convenient, but when it's hard. Not just to speak the truth to the other side, Train the fire on Biden. That's the mantra in the Republican Party. I do that too. That's fine. But you can't speak the truth to the other side if you're not speaking it to our own party and our own failures right here at home. Which brings me. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, that's really what it means, right? I care less for the Republican Party. I care for this country. Right? The Republican Party is a vehicle to advance our.
our pro-American agenda. And I was, I was probably going to get me in trouble, but I don't know how much worse they can do. Ron McDaniel said, I'm not going to get another cent of funding from the RNC, so you can't go lower than zero anyway, right? So, so, so might as well call that out. I mean, I think, I, I'll just be honest with you, I voted Libertarian in my first election in 2004. I couldn't stand Bush or Kerry with the Iraq War. I'm using the Republican Party as a vehicle to advance our pro-American agenda. And I think that goes beyond partisan politics. I think it's interesting that this issue, that I would give the leaders of the Free Soil Coalition here, Free Soil Project, a lot of credit. It's not about partisanship. I understand the Sierra Club's involved. Is that right? Great. So, so you can disagree with certain people on certain issues, but still stand for them for what is right. So I don't care who you are. I will never stand with you if you stand on the side of wrong. I will always stand with you if you're on the side of right. That's the kind of leadership we're going to have to bring to Washington, D.C. in this country. And this is within the power of the U.S. president to fix. So that's the fifth thing I want everybody to take away. Swear an oath to the Constitution. Yeah, it was in the subsidies. Good luck with that. Okay? It's not it's just broken Congress isn't going to happen. But if it's going to a party that is unconstitutionally using eminent domain, then it does not go through. That's with the U.S. president. I think that, I would challenge, I think it'd be great if the other presidential candidates took this up. I mean that for the sake of this cause, that would be a good thing. And I'm rooting for them to do it. But I want to close on this, because I think it's really important. I want you to ask yourself why. This is not boasting, this is not anything else. It's not even about me. It's about the system and people leaving here understanding how this system works and how this game is played. Why am I the only major presidential candidate who's been able to take this issue on head on? I appreciate the kind words that Others have said about me, courage and everything else. That's, I, I appreciate that, but I can't accept that, actually. I think that most people who actually set out to do something like this are actually, when they get started, good people. Not all of them, but most of them, I believe, are. They're good people tainted by a broken system. That's really what this game is. And so every politician dances to the tune of their biggest villain. That's a fact. It is sad that we live in a moment where it takes somebody, in my case, my biggest donor is me. That's what it's going to take to break this corrupt system. And the same reason I'm the only one able to speak about this issue, I'm the only presidential candidate, I don't know you all are here for this issue, but I draw a string through a bunch of others. You may or may not agree with me on all of these. I'm the only presidential candidate who's able to say that Ukraine is not some democracy, and that our taxpayer money is going to fund the persecution of Christians. I'm the only one who's able to say we will pardon peaceful protesters from January 6th. I'm the only one to say I will pardon Donald Trump. He's the persecution of the prosecution. And Ronna McDaniel will step down as the failed chairwoman of the RNC. That our climate change agenda is a hoax that birthright citizenship does not apply to the kids of illegal migrants. That too is what swearing out to the Constitution means. That the FBI, once it's gone beyond a certain point of failure, the right answer can't be to reform it. We have to shut it down. And there's a reason why. And you all go first for a reason, right? And, and this is, I mean, I'm running for president, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, just, I'm here for a reason. I told you I'm going to continue on this issue no matter what, but I'm going to be, going to be frank with you. Because there's a very important decision you guys have in about 45 days. I mean, the impact you all have on who the next president is, I'm a math guy, and there's different ways you could look at this, but you could make an argument. It's like the equivalent of a million people speaking with the voice of every person who shows up at the Iowa caucus in terms of the impact that that has on the ultimate result. I want you to think about that. You all choose who occupies that White House, who it is that swears an oath to that Constitution next. And I want you to take that responsibility seriously. When you do, if somebody else is going to do this more effectively than me, then go with them. But it has to be somebody 
who is able to speak the truth in a way that is unconstrained and take on, not just this issue, and by the way, if you put me in that office on this issue, we will see that through. We will not disperse subsidies to anybody who's using eminent domain, because I swear an oath to the Constitution, higher than any other corrupt law. But it's deeper than that. It's not just on this issue. You deserve a president. We, the people, deserve a president who approaches every decision that that president makes through that same lens and that same commitment. That's how we got to where we are, but we don't have to stay there. I'm not going to walk in here and tell you right now that it's morning in America. It's not. Or well, we wouldn't be in this room today. But it can be. I'm not going to tell you the American dream is alive and well. Part of the American dream is about protecting your property rights. It is not alive and well. It is alive and hanging on for life support. But it can be. So I'm asking you all to do your part. The number one thing I'll ask you, tell 100 people. That's a, that's a big ask, to say 100 people. I know that takes some work. But you took the effort to be here. You care about this issue. So I'm asking you to do something about it. Being here, being upset about it, being enraged as I am. I'm listening to some of this. I mean, yeah, I learned a lot from the people who spoke before me. Thank you. you took notes on that. I'm going to take that with me. From me or the other speakers, take what you learned today. And every one of you has a responsibility to spread that to 100 people around this state to make a demand of your political leadership, all the way up to and including your government, to have the courage to speak for the citizens that they represent. That's the number one thing that I ask of you. And then it turns out that because there is something the U.S. President can do to address this issue in 45 days, how long is it? January 15th, it's a holiday. 30 minutes of your time to save this country. 30 minutes of your time to stand for the Constitution in this country. Pick whoever you think is going to be best loyal to keeping that oath on the hard issues. The easy ones we all agree on. We all agree that men should not compete with women in sports competitions, right? At least that's the other candidates have now been eliminated. The ones who remain, at least all agree on that. Okay, and, and that's great. That's an important issue. I stand, I mean, I stand strongly for that issue. I think it's a mental health epidemic in East End. But not just on the easy ones, but on the hard issues, like the one we're here to discuss today, the one that will affect whether or not pipelines run through farmers' land who don't want that pipeline running through, or God forbid something happening like what happened in Mississippi, where people in a town are sent to a hospital over some hoax that was perpetrated on the farmers of this state. Whoever you think is going to actually best Keep their oath to the Constitution when it's not just easy, but when it's hard. Go out on January 15th, that Monday night. Take 30 minutes. Bring those same 100 people with you. And bet that our country's best days can still yet be ahead of us. Thank you for having me today, guys. God bless you. God bless the families. God bless our United States of America. I think my uh, diving deep into this, somebody who I've gotten to know only in person very recently, but I gotta say, I think we hit it off pretty well. <laughs> Mostly because we went into the details. And uh, this guy who fits the description that I just gave you for somebody who is going to stand for what is true, not just when it's easy, but when it's hard. And you know what, you know what happens when you're standing for truth? I've got some taste of this, but this man's got the full serving of it. That's where the mainstream media comes for you. They'll take something you say and pervert it into something else that it never was. Because, not because they care about that person, but because they don't want you to see the truth. Well, here's a man who doesn't care left or right on this issue. Proud of partnering with people on the other end of this political spectrum to do what's right in this state. Steve King, come on up here, man. Thank you.